that statement there. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for being here today. I'm here with Rachel Jacobs this uh, this Thursday. Rachel is telling me that I should start wearing lipstick, so I'm going to start wearing lipstick. Well, you don't have to, but when people say you look great, I'm like, it's just lipstick. And as women, I, I really... we have the luxury of being able to put on lipstick and it looks like we've made an effort. I have washed yeah, today, I... but that's it lipstick and having a wash. I need to start I need to start using it. So <laughs> guys, I'm here with Rachel. I'm a big fan of Rachel. I've been following her for a long time. I'm sure most of you that are watching this, wherever you're watching right now, you can hear of course that motorcycle, but also you probably seen Rachel on uh, social media because she's the one person that's like the mother Teresa of agencies, the person that has helped so many agencies build from the ground up, build their strategies and get profitable. So Rachel is the founder founder of e-commerce partnerships. Rachel, thank you so much for accepting to come here today. Of course. So I just want to kick right into this and ask you for anyone, like for people who don't know what you're doing, what mm -hmm. is e-commerce partnerships? How did you start, you know, babying agencies in e-commerce? Babying agencies. It does feel like that. It does feel like <laughs> a, speed. a lot of agencies, especially when it's mostly men. Um, so my background is I have been in an e-commerce space for about five years. So I'd say somewhere around five, six years. Before that, I was in the SaaS world. But I'm a marketer, so content and partnerships is what I've done for most of my career. Um, and then about five years ago, I fell into SaaS. Uh, I was in SaaS in the blockchain world and AWS and then went into e-commerce. Um, so I did e-commerce SaaS side, and that was amazing. Um, and then, of course, I went to the dark side and, and joined an agency of a COO. So I joined one of the top, one of the leading Shopify Plus agencies in London as their COO and came in and put a lot of structure and, and, and process and hired and scale. And, and really one of the main things, the biggest wins for me, like when you fix the delivery process is one thing, and then you hire a project manager and, and have some sort of structure in place, then sales, then marketing, so top of the funnel. It doesn't fix the real fucking problem for agencies, which is the fact that our industry is so cyclical. You'll have like, like right now, things are kind of dead for a lot of people. It's the summertime, especially on the back of COVID. And for a lot of agencies, it's like one of the worst s series of months that they've had since COVID happened. I think people, we just got, a lot of agencies got fat and happy um, for the last 12, 18 months. And then the summertime hit, vaccines, people can travel. And it's like, oh shit, the pipeline just died. Um, so retainers, and that really was the biggest learning lesson for me when in the agency that I have run, um, is building out a retainer model, a scalable retainer model, um, and, and building that sort of like 360, it doesn't really matter what services that you're offering, but sort of that holistic 360 approach to scaling a brand. Um, so I did that. We scaled that very significantly, increased revenues by just over 500% in about five or six months. Um, and then it was time for me to move on to something else. Um, and I really, I knew that I'd done this with one agency um, and I thought, well, maybe it, is this something that I can do with others? To be honest, when I left, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, I'm not going to bullshit and be like, oh, I fucking built this business and I did it out of my garage. And then when it was time to like scale it, then I just, no, that did not happen. It was a very quick exit from the agency I worked at. Um, and I was suddenly in a situation where it's like, I don't want to work with another company again because I'm a bad bitch and I just need to work for myself. So I need to figure out what the fuck I'm doing. And I had a lot of agencies contact me, a lot of SaaS companies contact me, but I knew that I had to do my own thing. I'd worked for myself as a contractor and consultant for years before. So it was better to just do it myself. Um, the first agency I worked with was Blend Commerce. I know that you know the guys, know Adam there really well. Yeah. I love those guys. Me too. Very, very, very yeah. good friends. We're very, very close now, very close to them and their family and work very closely with their team. They were the first agency and they were one of the people that reached out to me and said, look, we, is there any way that you can join us? And I was just like, no, <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> but what I can do is I can like sit down with you and let's figure out a roadmap and figure out um, like how we can help scale your agency. And they came to me and said, we have got three months to turn this ship around. And if we don't, it's we're done. Like we don't have any more runway. Um, they had to take out money to actually work with me. And this was when I first started. So I was just like, okay, cheapest cost that I could possibly afford. Okay, it's going to cost you a thousand euros a month. That's fine. And I'll work with you like an interim or fractional COO. Yeah. Um, and then I spent a couple of months before we worked together. I spent a few months building out this like four step approach to skating agencies from messaging right through to retention. Um, and they were kind of my guinea pig. 
Um, I, I mean, I've done it before, so I knew what I was doing, but to do it with another agency that's not yours, or you're not working in is different. Within six weeks, we landed over $40,000 worth of recurring revenue. We locked right. in a lot of money. And that's what you have to do at the start, right? You just cash injection, get shitload of money into the business, take that money, reinvest, build the team, and then scale. Um, and it, that's the case for most agencies or a lot of agencies that come my way. They just need a cash injection. They just need to like get money in to then feed the team and build the yeah. team and then build on top of that. And that's what we did. Um, and I was still working with SaaS companies, but I wasn't loving it. Like I was still doing content for SaaS yeah. companies and building partner programs. And I wasn't like, I wasn't super passionate about it. It's not that I couldn't do it. I can do whatever the fuck it is that I want to do, but I wasn't, it didn't get me excited. Um, and then I started working with those guys and got amazing results. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go completely rogue. I'm going to cut off all of my other work. I'm not going to work with them anymore. And I'm just going to do this. And that was actually two years this month that I made that decision. Oh, wow. Um, and since then, I have worked with more than 60 agencies as a fractional or interim COO and consulted with over 600. Wow. Um, so it's a lot. COVID helped, obviously. Um, yeah. but I'm the only person in the industry who does what I do that just solely specializes in e-commerce, uh, in e-commerce agents. Yeah. And, I, and I fucking love it. And that's the thing when people say to me, oh, it's so amazing. It's long hours. It's hard work. It's dealing with a lot of problems. Um, I think COVID has highlighted as well the, like the softer side of it, where I'm working with agency owners that have mental health issues and team members that are dealing with mental health issues. Yeah. I have one of the agencies that I work very close with um, who lost a, a team member to suicide. So you're having this sort of conversations that you would never, like for me, it's just like, let me just come in and fix this shit. And then you realize that in a lot of cases, the deeper you get into a business and the more business scales and the stuff that's broken it, are people. Um, so it's navigating those sides. I was a nurse previously, so it allows me to kind of lean into some of those skills um, that I built previously in my career. But it's been amazing like i can honestly say i get to work with some of the people that i work with are some of the best people i've ever met like really really amazing hard working um super fucking smart entrepreneurs like really 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 smart entrepreneurs uh and i fucking love it That's i absolutely awesome. love it and i'm fucking crazy i mean i'm irish so i am i am crazy i'm definitely on an acquired taste um and whether people like me or not i couldn't give a shit Listen, I'm not even Irish and I want to acquire taste, so I feel you with that very well. <laughs> cool. So I want to, there's a lot of, of things to unpack there. Thank you for, uh, for starting like that because now you just gave me like so many angles to this. I like the fact, I like what you're saying about how important it is to define the structure of a company and uh, how important it is to define processes, procedures, and then allocate resources and to have a flow. So operation operations and operational excellence is not something that you see entrepreneurs talking about. Most of them, mm -hmm. when they're getting into it, they just want to sell and they think sales cure, cures everything. Mm -hmm. And of course, sales are important. You got to grow from something. But then you end up hiring shit lo loads of people. You pay them big salaries and you're getting two, three clients and then you realize you don't have no procedures, nothing mm -hmm. works and you cannot repeat systems. So I want to ask you something because operations is a very, very important part for me and it was like it's serendipity for me right now because i just had a conversation about this tell me what do you tell of an agency founder that comes to you starts a, a team has an agency has been trying struggling for six months but they want to grow through sales and they don't understand the importance of having operational excellence at least at an entry level so you can build from it mm -hmm. It's a good question because it's, I mean, a lot of agencies that come to me when I, so pre-COVID, the way I used to work with agencies, I, I would meet them, they, they would come to me, I would go to them, um, and we would audit their business. Um, and all of the pain points and the problems and the inefficiencies and the over-servicing, ultimately it comes down to process. Um, and it, it kind of is that class of de debate between revenue and profit. I am on the profit side. Of course, like we said before we started this podcast, in injecting money into a business, it's not complicated. And I don't mean that to sound like an asshole, but it's not complicated. Every agency I've ever worked with, building out, usually the way I start with agencies is building out retainer models or building out pay discovery models. Cash injection is not something I struggle with at all. 
profitability is completely different and profitability comes down to process because that is efficiency. It's about an agency owner being able to offload and delegate tasks and responsibilities to people in their team that they're paying so those people can go and do the work so you can focus on the money. Um, there's a guy who's pretty well known, Simon Sinek, and he talks about uh, like know your why and, and all this sort of stuff and he breaks people down. Um, and he talks about uh, the why person who is the visionary and the high person who is the implementation or the execution person. And then the high people, they're like the foot soldiers that do the work. And even though I'm an entrepreneur in my own right and I have my own business and technically I'm a visionary, but I am a million, I read that book and I am a million percent resonated with that person in the middle that connects the rest of the team with the business owner. And that's the role I've played in pretty much every company I've ever had. Um, and it's the role I play even in my own business because all of the, the agencies that I work with they are the visionaries and I don't want to make them be anything other than what they are because if you don't have a visionary, the captain of the ship has got to be a visionary. If they don't have that skill set, your business is not going to succeed. And unfortunately, the consequence to being that kind of person where you have all the ideas and like you're really good at inspiring people, they're fucking terrible when it comes to like details and execution and getting shit done, which is what I do very, very well and always have. Um, so I always say, and, and with the work that I do with a lot of agencies as they grow, I do a lot of hiring and I hire people in those roles and coach and train up people in those roles to take over general manager, ops manager, director of ops, COO, whatever that looks like. But it's absolutely crucial to making this person at the top be the best they can be. And the other person underneath is basically the buffer between the rest of the team and them, because those visionary people, they're fucking all over the place. And when it comes to implementation, the implementation team are just like, I can't deal with this bullshit because stuff is changing all the time. So it's somebody like me or someone in the company that kind of neutralizes yeah. that kind of mad scientist, which I love. I love being on the receiving end of that. I love all the ideas and the innovation. I'm just like, okay, there's like 15 ideas. Most of them are horseshit, but there's two or three ideas here, which are amazing. And let's figure out how we can take that to the next step. That's really what process comes to, because for me in that middle role, the process then is how I like delegate that down and pass that down and get it through the line so it gets done. Man, like there's nothing I hate more than, uh, you know, having a vision, doing your stuff and then having someone just, you know, like changing stuff every day. Like it's, it's very crazy. And this is something that happens. And I do get why it happens because again, that mad scientist has mm. amazing ideas all the time, but it's like sometimes to the most important part. And I say this a lot is to allow your team to define their pace, to find their pace, because in order to be able to be, to have, you know, performance in a role, you have to understand what's my speed. How much time do I need to invest in a project to deliver into this project? Like there's so many things that matter. And I think uh, these are the biggest learnings that I'm having lately. It's like the more you encourage a, 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 a team to be autonomous and take responsibility mm -hmm. for their time and their deliverables, the better they do. And they don't need that coaching and micromanagement. Mm -hmm. They just need support to be able to become autonomous. Mm -hmm. So I really, really believe in that. And because I work in SaaS, but in the agency world is a total different story. And I do relate to the fact that if I was to choose sometimes, you know, like I love SaaS, but sometimes it pisses the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. So I get it. But from an agency perspective, so as a SaaS vendor, as you know, I work with plenty of agencies. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem that I find sometimes with agencies is the, um, uh, the adoption that they have to new services and new technologies. And I do get it because they have clients that they need to service. It's those billable hours. It's the mm -hmm. fact that they need to deliver and they cannot necessarily stop to learn a product or to learn mm -hmm. a methodology. But like, why would you say, because we're talking about e-commerce, like all the changes that happen in e-commerce right now with the consent-based marketing, with privacy, with ads, with emails. What do you think about how should agencies approach this? Because a lot of them are used to doing things as they're used to doing things, mm -hmm. but they're not transitioning to this retention, customer mm -hmm. lifetime value, uh, you know, vision that's happening right now. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel pretty strongly about it. For when I first was in the agency world, I, I built retainers off tech stack because I came from the SaaS world. I came yeah. from AWS and technology. So I know it's like, it's about efficiency, right? And you can do things the same thing over and over again, but increasingly that's, so they're going to become less efficient. And for me as an entrepreneur, 
less efficiency equals losing money. That's how I equate the two things. Um, so I feel really, really strongly about building retainer models off a tech stack and really as an agency defining who you are off the clients you work with and the technologies that bring them together. I work very closely with a number of technologies that I worked with in the agency world and continue to work with and tech stacks that I, I believe are essential in our industry. So this certain like Loyalty Line, I've worked closely with them for years. Rewind worked closely with them for years. Gorgeous, I've worked really closely yeah. with them. Playdio, like those kind of key technologies that are mandatory for a wide variety of clients. Um, and especially in light of the pandemic, Customer retention is one of the key focal points for, from an agency point of view, for our merchants. That's what their number one thing yeah. is. It's like, I want to retain more customers. I built my business off building retainer models for agencies and building retainer models that are based on retention, the retention of the customer, the retention of their customer. It's like a, you know, a, a self-feeding machine where we're all, we all have the end goal and we're all feeding each other. Um, so I think agencies, and I have definitely seen this change significantly in the last 12 to 18 months. I think agencies should be much more aware of the partners that they're working with and not, I had some agencies like, yeah, I've got fucking 200 partners. No, you don't. That's horseshit. Just because you get like a pair of socks from a couple of like a hundred different agencies. Or, socks, oh my God. That is, that is not a yeah, yeah, different t-shirt. Like it, that's, that's not a partnership. <laughs> Because the agencies that really win, like the agencies that really saw through or were able yeah. to get over the initial dip that COVID had, yeah. were the agencies that had good partnerships because their tech partners helped them get over that. Part. Of them, yeah, exactly. So, and, and I see a lot of agencies now increasingly bringing people in to run partnerships and bringing people in to run yeah. a channel um, because. I mean, it's you have three. You've got three channels when it comes to agency sales. You've got inbound; they're the leads that are coming to you. You've got outbound; they're the leads that you're going out and getting. And you have channel; they're the partnerships. They are your three sales strategies as an agency, and you have to have all three of them working. So that when one or two of them drops off, you have something else there as a safety net. And most agencies just rely either on referrals, inbound, or they try and crack the outbound funnel fucking very difficult i don't know many agencies that have cracked that consistently and then some agencies i know do partnerships very 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 well i know one agency i work with turns over around five million a year and 50 percent of his business is from partners wow yeah <laughs> that's a lot of fucking money but the, honestly like there are very good partnership programs that are done by uh, vendors and uh, i think most vendors in e-commerce most are very respectful of their partners and i think at this stage as we are right now in the business it's easier to do uh, you know this type of partnership and go to a client like for me for instance when i someone is asking me for email marketing i always i'm gonna go to adam from magnet monster because i know his agency if i refer them to a client they will do that shit right mm -hmm. so it's like very important for someone that is client facing because vendors are client facing all day like we have to do outreach we have to have fucking calls we have to sell right so it's so important to have some agencies that you work with very closely so you can refer your customers mm -hmm. and know that that agency is gonna give value on your product because mm -hmm. the product is just a piece of the puzzle but talking about this uh you know this whole uh combination of technology and agencies i want to ask you something like something that really pisses me off is that um when you take a piece of technology whatever the technology is and then you take a client there are there's a part missing from the agency side not all the time but in most agency the strategy part is missing so the agency is more tactical versus strategic so mm -hmm. let me to give you an example let's say i'm a brand i sell fashion and whatever i hire an email marketing agency and that email marketing agency is gonna apply some tactics on me that they use for 10 other fashion brands. But they don't have that strategy part that takes the data, breaks it down and builds a strategy. Mm -hmm. So where do you see the role of the strategies? Like the person that just takes the data and interprets it and tells the agency, okay, this is what you should do. Where do you see that role coming in the future given the whole data you know, uh, uh, movement that's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, well, data direct, data driven recommendations really at the core of um, good retainers. Like that's really what it comes down to, and it's really the difference between an agency that is reactive 
Um, so you're just going to react to the demands of your customer. Like, I want this shit done and I want this shit done. It's like, okay, we're just going to fucking do the shit that you tell us to do. Or an agency that's proactive, an agency that's going to go out and look at the data and figure out where the gaps are. I just did actually a masterclass just literally before this with the private group of agencies that I run. And I, we, I, I hosted a little masterclass on selling in Black Friday, Cyber Monday retainers. And basically I said, it's like, this is in order for this to work, it's about being proactive as an agency yeah. and looking at the data and making recommendations based on what makes sense. But I will say it's a very difficult role to fill for an agency. It's a hard role to fill. Um, agencies that I see do it well are agencies that either the agency owner makes a good job of it and they know the data. But again, the problem with that is the fact that that agency owner is never able to get out from under the business and the work that they have to do. Yeah. Um, or agencies that have, they're growing. So agencies that are 15, 20 people and they can afford to bring in strategists. Um, it, it, it is very difficult. It's a difficult role. If I could supply agencies with, you know, data analysts or strategists, e-com strategists to actually come in and, and review the data. We had it in, in the agency I ran, we had somebody dedicated to that and it was a game changer. Um, oh, yeah. for ag agencies that are much smaller, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Me personally, I'm allergic to Google Analytics. Like it's totally <laughs> against my religion. I don't believe in it. I don't even want to open it. I don't like the UX. I think it's so ugly. It's just not my thing. It's too many numbers. Um, so I hate that, but I also appreciate that that's where all of the good stuff comes from. Yeah. And not only also your Shopify database, like when you're having a, a brand, like everything that's good, it's actually mm -hmm. behind that uh, data in Shopify. And I mean, right now, when everyone is focused so much on customer experience and building um, customer journey and building retention, it's very important, this data layer. And I see... Um, you're right. I see that it's becoming so important and I'm looking on LinkedIn and, you know, see different mm -hmm. things like we're looking for a head of data, we're looking for a data analyst. So I'm happy to see this because, um, you know, I've been I've been at that bridge as you are, that bridge to make teams work. I've been that bridge between data and um, uh, business. And I'm happy because I see this becoming a habit. And I think, you know, even if it's a slow movement, I think all of us in e-commerce, we're moving to a much more smarter phase. Mm -hmm. than we used to be and i think it's humbling in a way because i mean there's great agencies because i want to move to this spot that you obviously always are going to get this question there's the great agencies that you love and you're just respecting but then there's the shit agencies right that you know like why do like if you ask you know e-commerce companies for four out of five they're, they're going to have a bad uh experience sure. with the agency like everyone knows this they will have a bad experience with the SaaS, right Ah, June here in the message. She said, Rachel, we need to talk about GA. June Lee, she owns a company. <laughs> June oh, is analyst. working with data. Yeah, June is working with data with GA. Like, <laughs> analytics for. June is a badass with data. Like, she's amazing. June, thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy that you're, she's become a very, um, you know, loyal listener. Thank you, June, for being here. Um, yeah, she's not allergic to GA. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, I mean, always, you know, you're going to have a bad experience. But why do you think some people are, like, so uh, narrow-minded when it comes to agencies? Because, yeah, you might have a shit experience, but you might have a shit experience with friendships and people that you meet anyway. Like, sure. it's a, you know, like, is it necessarily a experience with the job or the services or it might be just the people experience? Like, what do you mm -hmm. think this is happening so often? I think a lot of people don't really know what they're doing, but the analogy that I like to use, um, because in the agency game, we get a lot of, you know, uh, burned clients that come our way. Anybody that's been in the agency world long enough will know you get people who come their way. Just like a relationship, they come with baggage. And the analogy I like to use is, have you ever been to a restaurant? We've all been to a restaurant. And if yeah. you've ever been to a restaurant and had a shit experience, we've all been to a restaurant and had a shit experience. That doesn't mean that we're never ever going to go to another restaurant again. It just means that we're going to make sure that we do due diligence the next time and we look at like like Google reviews or or whatever it is or go on recommendation. And that's really the difference. Um, there are a lot of shit agencies out there. Um, a lot of it is amateur, and I think being an entrepreneur, it's hard, right? Running your own business is really hard. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, and for me, I actually posted something on LinkedIn today because. I'm the only person in the industry who does what I do. So I, and I have a great network and I've got amazing agencies that I've helped deliver 
millions of dollars worth of revenue on the back of the work that I've done with them, 20, 30 millions of dollars of revenue for the agencies that I work with right now. So I, I bring results and my agencies are not shy about talking about that on LinkedIn and, you know, thanking me for the work I've done publicly. So I got a lot of agencies that reach out to me a lot. The amount of agencies that reach out to me and are happy to get on calls and have conversations and expect to have more conversations and more conversations and me to help them and help them with their strategies without wanting to fucking invest or respect my time or even be willing to even acknowledge the fact that I've put several hours of my time. That, I mean, I work 80, 100 hours a week anyway and put time in my yes, evening to get on calls and help them. And it's just like, if you don't want to invest in your business and you want, you expect people to come in and give you a handout, then that is the approach. That's the image that you're going to put out to other people and you will not succeed because people can see that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's shit agencies out there. Sometimes, you know, like the expression, they say, you don't know what you don't know. And in some cases I speak to agencies and I'm just like, you're doing it all fucking wrong. All you need to do is just change this, this. I spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago and he talked me through um, his pricing strategy and I told him that what you're making right now on a monthly basis, you should be making three times the amount. You just need to tweak these three different pricing models and just change them and you will immediately 3x your revenue. He didn't know that. He had no clue. He just was like, I was a freelancer and I was charging, I don't know, let's say 500 euro and now I'm charging a thousand euro and that's twice as much as I was charging before. And if I increase it to 1.5 and I'm like, everybody else is charging five. Like I know, right? Just fucking skip to the top. Like the service is good. You know what you're doing. Like, skip. and sometimes it's confidence. People don't know what they're doing. Some people are just fucking assholes, um, and they shouldn't be in business anyway. And they'll keep losing customers. And I've had a fair share of those come across my path. And I'm just like bullshit detector. I don't want to fucking work with you. I am not a psychologist. I'm not here to fix your fucking mummy issues or whatever's wrong with you. And there's some people they just don't know that they're fucking up. Um, so there are shit agencies out there. Nine times out of 10, it's through defaults. Um, it's, it's out of default and they just need to be pointed in the right direction. There is one out of 10, maybe two out of 10. They just cannot help themselves. And <laughs> I, just, I just stand back and just let them crash and burn. <laughs> do, you yeah. think, do you think the entry, uh, entry barrier is very, very low right now to become a consultant totally. or open an agency versus how it was maybe like five years ago. Yeah, I, I think it is. And it's super saturated. You know, our industry is one of the fastest growing industries. I mean, I think probably behind pharmaceutical, but it's one of the fastest growing industries right now in the world. Um, so yeah, there is a low barrier to entry. And if you just have a small skill set, then you can kind of come in and sort of flex and position yourself much bigger than what you are. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't walk the walk, the results is going to speak for itself, right? If you can't really follow through, if you can't execute on the promises that you're making, your business is not going to go anywhere. And the bottom line, we all start from zero. We all have to build that up and not everything is going to be perfect and you're going to make mistakes along the way. But don't fucking big yourself up to be this like big dog person that can achieve all this amazing stuff and rip off other people um, just to kind of get ahead. You don't. I see a lot of people do that in our industry and it's disgusting. <laughs> It's really not good. I do too. <laughs> I see I see people that actually work with recruitment agencies and specifically go to their recruiter and say, I want that person in that agency that's a friend of mine. Oh my god. It's dirty. I mean, there's a huge let's get to this point, like there's a huge lack of talent. And talent costs a shitload of money. I don't but know if there's a lack of talents. It's budgets. The budgets have increased so astronomically i recruited somebody on behalf of one of my agencies i recruited yeah. somebody recently for a like head of growth but basically in, like adwords but a, yeah adwords role um hundred and fifty thousand dollars there is for no year. for a year yeah but there's no way it's just for me i see that money and i'm like shit i'm in the wrong job like i need to like i know right well i'm not gonna learn analytics so it's not gonna work for me <laughs> <laughs> you heard oh, that june, june yeah. you have to get you june because i know you're here you have to take rachel uh in one of your trainings i like, don't know i, I, I think I, you. she's I very think persuasive me. I don't know. I think I'd need some sort of lobotomy to get me over my uh, my fear. <laughs> oh my god! But you know, you know what's crazy about talent? Because you know, this is this is what pisses me off. Like you, you and me both spend a lot of time on social media, and we both have you know 
you, yours obviously is bigger than mine, but we have a circle and we know people. So it's like driving me insane how much bullshit some people go on social media. Oh, yeah. And it's like, you know, I did this and I brought like triple ROS and I did that. And I know personally you didn't do that. But the problem is people are going to believe it because these people have a lot of um, clout, right? Because they're just doing things for that clout, so the clout builds. And then you end up hiring people. And I've worked with brands that hire someone that's an influencer right now. And mm -hmm. I don't want to name names. But then they came to me and they were asking me desperately for a good agency because that guy really fucked them up. Mm -hmm. So this is a very big problem right now because anyone with a computer can come on social media, build an account, and be like, you know, I'm the whatever, you know, Brian mm -hmm. Belfort of, you know, of e-commerce. And it's really, really crazy. And I think... Mm -hmm it's this talent costs a lot of money and i think the the thing with people that are very good and very talented they're sitting on huge salaries in different companies and it's very hard to get those people and there's a lot of poaching that happens which i do agree it, uh, it's something that's dirty and it's not uh, and it's not cool but now let's uh, let's switch because this is my favorite <laughs> my favorite part so do you look at, i mean look around this quarter this q4 is going to be a disaster at, for me at least shipping times shipping prices i think you saw it's for brands it's a very bad period but also i'm talking about what's going to happen with these agencies and with ios 14.5 and ios 15 and all like everything that we knew that was working so far mm -hmm. in terms of you know tactical you know sp tactically speaking it's not going to work anymore mm -hmm. do you think that agencies are ready to deal with this type of marketing that is, you know, every day growing more and more? Uh, depends on the type of agency. Um, so because I'm in the e-commerce space, there's, I'd say at least 50% of my network um, are dev only. So they're dev agencies and they're doing very much tactical stuff. And then yeah. there's other agencies then I'd say the another two thirds of the rest of the audience is probably full service where they're doing marketing and dev. And then there's a portion then of my audience that is just marketing only. I think the yeah. marketing only agencies have been hit pretty hard. Um, they've been hit really hard. I had a catch up with one of my agencies last night who is email, an email only agency. Yeah, email he's, is bad right now. He's been really smashed. Um, he's not like he, but he's bringing in customers at a good rate, but because the customers that are actually leaving are pausing because of the iOS changes, he's actually declining. Um, so a lot of the agencies have been hit hard. Are they ready for the I feel like it's a bit of an unknown. Um, so, and some agencies say, oh, well, it's going to shake out in the end. It will all be fine. And people will get over it. And we've been through these changes before. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not a witch. I'm not a clairvoyant. I can't see in the future. So I have no idea what it, things are changing for sure. How it's going to impact this Black Friday, it's anyone's guess. Just like I was saying earlier, I did a presentation on um you know black friday retainers and setting those in and, and getting i can share i can share it with you actually i can share the share the slides um, Oh, that's awesome please do so black, getting ready for black friday as an agency being proactive around that and just looking at the data from 2019 to 2020 there was like a 73 or 74 percent increase just in that year alone are we going to see that for 2021 probably not it's probably going to be not that drastic because if, if it is, I mean, that's a hell of a lot to keep up with. Um, has ch tr trends changed significantly because of COVID? Absolutely, especially trending more towards retention um, and how that has impacted agencies. I actually have a little retreat. So every every three months, I try and get a group of agencies together in person. And I live in Gran Canaria. So it's a Spanish island off the coast of Morocco. It's a perfect place to get people together for. So jealous. Yeah, sun, sea, sand, and shenanigans, and sangria, tequila. But we can have sangria as well. Um, and I, I have at the end of next month in September, the the group of agencies that I work with privately, they're coming over, and we're actually doing what the the retreat is dedicated to customer retention. Oh, that's we're so awesome. be Focused on building out a retention retainer and what that looks like, and and how you communicate that with clients, because that's really what it's all about. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. That's yeah. really, that's really, at this time of year, that's what it's about. It's not really about building big websites or doing any of that. It's about how do you, if you're not on the acquisition side of e-commerce, if you're on the on the other side of e-commerce, the, the bottom yeah. end of the funnel, like how do you take those customers and understand buyer behavior and look at those new demographics and then turn them into loyal customers? Like what does that piece look like? 
I, I wish I was a, a fly on the wall in that conversation. And as you know, retention is my my favorite topic. But you're right. it's my that is 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 what I love most. But uh, you know, you know what? You nailed it in the head. Like I have agencies that love what I do, but then they have to have the conversation with the client, and the client understands fuck all of what I do. Mm -hmm. And then it's very hard because that message that the agency takes to the client is very important to be defined because the retainers or retention are actually higher mm -hmm. than on acquisitions because you're being mm -hmm. you're making profits. You're making changes in the whole company. But the problem is how do you sell it to someone that's used to just pumping you know money on acquisitions every month and every month and every month and even if you tell them like i have the clients i have brands that i work with and i'm telling them like yo you're losing thirty thousand dollars every mm -hmm. week every week you're throwing this money out because you're acquiring mm -hmm. shitty customers they never come mm -hmm. back and then they're like and i don't know what to do and they get scared because data is a bitch this is what happens mm -hmm. when, you, when you do data and then they was like yeah i'm gonna do this and then they never respond. And then I hear, you know, I'm working with this acquisition agency and they just go back to doing that because people are so afraid of what's going to happen. They're not playing to win. They're playing not to lose. Mm -hmm. So most people just go back to this old habit because it keeps them thinking that they're making some sort of progress. So I think if you find a way to productize the way you communicate as an agency to your client, mm -hmm. the solution, I, that, I think that that's terrific. Uh, I told you I would love to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and hear that, that's amazing. So I have one last question for you, which is from our sponsor from Vtex, vtex.com for whoever is listening right now. They're asking me, what are the top three things someone that wants to start an agency in e-commerce should consider before you know, being happy about being an agency in e-commerce? Like, what can you tell these ambitious people? People who are getting started or people that are looking to scale? People that are getting started. Good luck. <laughs> uh, for people that are just getting started, I think in business, uh, just in general, I think one of my biggest tips, uh, know your customer. And I think that if you're just getting started in the agency game, the ones that I have seen that have, I spoke to somebody recently and they went from zero to 150,000 a month revenue nice. in 18 months because he only spe specializes in one specific thing. Um, when people say to me, oh my God, you've built this business and I have other people that I know and friends and entrepreneurs and they built their business around the same time. They're like, fucking hell, how did you like grow so quickly? Yeah. Because I know my customer, like I know exactly my customer, I know exactly my solution. And more importantly, to the point you made earlier, identifying a pain point. Like to me, that is the biggest win. It's not about sales, it's about consultancy. It's about really identifying a pain point because yeah. you can be narrative and sell the service or you can be strategic and sell the solution. And that's really what it comes down to. So the more you understand like, what is, what is it that you're offering and what problem does that solve for the person that I wanna work with? And then you sell that strategy and you sell that solution. Um, I always say, and again, because I'm you know, trained as a nurse, of course I'm gonna use a medical analogy, but you have to diagnose before you can actually give a re like, uh, recommend a remedy. You need to be able to diagnose people. And I think that that's one of the biggest things. They're like, okay, I'm a great developer. I can build great sites. How do you scale that? Like, I mean, how do you really find that customer? Where does your lead generation come? What differentiates you? How do people know that they should be working for you than someone else? Rather than coming in and being like, I know this tech stack really fucking well. I know to integrate this solution with this solution. And I do it where it's, you know, do it in half the time. Okay, that's an amazing USP because I know exactly what customer I'm going after and it's much easier to build a marketing strategy or an acquisition strategy around that. So really knowing your customer for sure has to be number one, really understanding what is their pain point um, and invest. Like you have to invest. I see so many agencies. I spoke to one very recently earlier this week. Um, amazing team, super nice. There are actually a couple running an agency, super, super, super nice. And he said, oh, I would, I would really, my biggest problem right now is my time. I don't have time to invest this stuff. And I would really love you to come in and point us in the right direction and guide us. And I don't consider myself a consultant. I fucking hate that word. It's my least favorite C word. I would consider myself a coach where it's like, okay, I'm going to give you the solutions. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to make sure that you fucking implement. Um, so he said, I'd love you to come in and like work with us. And then he went on to tell me that he is working full time in another company 
because he doesn't want to like whatever like for obvious reasons that he wants to be safe and i'm just like how do you expect me like how could how should i feel comfortable you investing in me if you don't even have enough faith to invest in yourself in your own company yeah like you don't bring somebody else in so like take money out of your business and invest that money back in and build that up and, and build a team around you um and again it's like i said earlier it's a massive pain in my arse where i have so many agencies that you know, oh, I love what you're doing. And I see like 10 X this company and you've helped this company with this. And I saw this testimony and I saw this video that an agency put out about you. I'd love you to come in and help. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not fucking mother Teresa. This is not a fucking charity. I have bills to pay as well. And if you want expertise, then we're going to pay for it. Exactly. It's not like super expensive, but you have to invest. You have to in yourself. invest in yourself and your and it, ultimately that's what it is, right? It's an investment in yourself, whatever that investment. Ultimately, like. Yeah. That's the outcome. Sorry. Like you become better, you become smarter. Even mm -hmm. if it's like, even if sometimes it's not a fit with anyone, at least you cannot become more stupid after mm -hmm. a conversation with anyone. But I don't think anyone should give away their time for free like that. For and, sure, uh, an investment looks different, right? For some people, investment is money. Some people, investment is time. Maybe investment means dedicating time to working out, or maybe it's like dedicating time, to, like going to bed on time, or getting more sleep, or switching yeah. up, whatever. Whatever that investment. But it is an investment at the end of the day and it's something that you have to do so i think really knowing your customer knowing their pain point and being willing to invest um, and in most cases when an agency is getting started out almost always you have people that are either on the tactical side so they're like really great developers or they're really great marketers or they're on like the operational side so they're really good like project managers or whatever yeah um it doesn't matter what skill you have Every single person that starts an agency, the number one value they bring to the business is sales. So I would always, always recommend that the first hire that you make almost always is going to be a project manager because you can outsource development, you can work with contractors, but that project manager, they need to eat, and eat sleep and breathe your business and your vision and your methodology. So I would always say like offload that responsibility first, dedicate your time to marketing and partnerships and sales, and then slowly build a team up underneath them. That, that usually is the smartest way to go about it. And recurring revenue. Yeah. You need to fucking get recurring revenue in because that's where your that's where your hires are going to come from. I love it. This is great. And this is like, Andrada, when you hear this, this is what I want you to quote. Because <laughs> she's, she's uh, listening right now. Rachel, when, where can people find you and pay you for your services? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I would love to make this a sales pitch, but I'm booked out to the end of the year, so <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't can take people any find business. you from the next from the from you know from next year. Where can people find you? Yeah, please? well, I mean, I have a different few different bits and pieces. Um, I do love to help agencies, so my website is e-commerce partnerships. Um, I have another website which is launched, but I haven't announced it yet, uh, okay. which is e-commerce agency growth. But e-commerce partnerships is the main place that people can find me. I do actually run once a month a round table specifically for e-commerce agencies. There's no charge, there's no fee. Basically what I wanted to do when I came into this industry is create a community. We're in an industry which is super dog eat dog. I came from an agency that was in London. Nobody fucking told anybody anything. It was horrible. So you just don't know how to benchmark. Um, so I created a round table that happens once a month. It's like the second Wednesday of every month. And it's a group of, there's a few hundred people in there now, but every month we have 20, 30, 40, 50 people turn up and we pick a specific topic and then we do a bit of knowledge sharing and share some insights. And for me, that's probably the best thing that I can offer to people. It's like, you don't need to pay anything, but you can join a community of people that are going to- learn a lot of stuff things. though. For sure, for sure. I told and you, I wanna be in one of those two one day. Yeah, if you're not a total fucking asshole, then maybe we can- I try not that. to be. No, not you personally, I'm just saying in general for agencies. That's a great filter. Trust me, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic filter that people come in there and, and to be able to see. Oh yeah, you can see them in their own exactly in their own. And it's great for me as well for people to come in and see what kind of personality I am. And some people will just be like, I like you more after this conversation. I really like you more. Like, <laughs> well, you're, yeah. you're, you're exactly on my heart. But also, they can find you on LinkedIn, right? So they can look for you on uh, Rachel Jacobs on uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, for anyone who's listening this you will find uh, Rachel's website in the episode footnotes and as well her LinkedIn profile so you can follow her and uh, connect with her because she drops a lot of great content and all the you know next uh, upcoming uh, roundtables will be uh, will be posted there. Rachel, thank you so much for coming. I just want to look quickly on LinkedIn because someone 
said that she completely loves your shirt. It's Elizabeth Morgan. You probably know who she is. She's from ICIMS. She says she loves your shirt. Let me see if there's any question before. We got it's, a dress. it's a dress that I got from the dress for 10 euros, FYI. And it is, I won't stand up because it is exceptionally short because I'm nearly six foot tall and these dresses are not made for tall people. So half of my arse is probably hanging out for the best of times. But it's an indoor, it's an indoor dress. Sometimes that's good. Especially I don't know. Great for my husband, maybe. Not for yeah. me. June, thank you so much for being here and everyone watching on uh, on YouTube right now. Uh, Rachel, this was awesome. Uh, I appreciate you being here. I'm watching you and uh, I hope everyone that listens to this will start watching and listening to you more and hire the fucking project manager. Hire that's the project it. manager. That's yeah. it. Thank you so Bye. much, Rachel. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.